Well, welcome back to EET 260. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about motors. And um, the first thing that I want to mention is that um, as you look in our um, course content, down here in the week 10, 11 uh, section, we have DC brushed, brushless, and stepper motors. So let's, um, let's go into that and look at the readings. And we have um, six YouTube URLs about DC motor types. So two are about brushed motors. Two are about brushless DC motors, or BLDCs, as people like to call them. And uh, the last two are about stepper motors. It, it is uh, important to watch all of those videos. And I think one theme that you'll see if you watch those videos with some um, perceptive uh, sort of uh, skills is that motors, you also notice this with AC motors, motors are all about some kind of a spinning thing, a rotor, that is chasing a magnetic field around, um, in a circular manner, around a, uh, uh, a stator or the outside or a field or something like that. But one way or another, um, a, a magnetic field is leading the um, rotor to move around, excuse me, to move around in a circular fashion that drives the... Um, um, that drives the, spe the, the spindle or shaft of the motor, <clears throat> um, you know, circular motion, rotary motion. And then you can use that to do work. So um, one thing I like to tell my first semester um, electronic students is that motors convert electrical energy to uh, mechanical energy. And that's true. And if you take a look at almost any kind of motor, if you spin the, uh, the axle or spindle or shaft of the motor mechanically, you will, um, the motor will actually generate um, electricity, which you can, you can pick up uh, typically from the, uh, the field or stator of the motor. This is also true, I think, with AC motors and to some degree, uh, depending on type. Ugh, so sorry. Um, and so this idea of a magnetic field um, in the rotor chasing a, a electrically uh, energized magnetic field that is, you know, leading it around in the stator, um, please note that in the videos. And note that, you know, um, putting electrical energy in to cause that rotating magnetic field and putting uh, and, and, and getting motion out. So electrical energy in and motion out is a, is a motor. And if we were to spin the motor mechanically, um, we would get electrical energy out. And that, of course, is called a generator. And if you uh, architect it, you might call it an alternator. So... Um, the, the next topic that you'll see is there's a, a, a minute and 17 second animation on rotary encoders. And, um, you know, uh, please read this description, but also see how the rotary encoder works. And um, it's an important motion control, uh, you know, item, a motion control uh, component so that people can detect the um, uh, the the, rot the the rotational position uh, of a motor in, in servo motors in um, like PID controllers and that sort of thing um, the rotary encoder is uh, really critical in, uh, it has to perform well oh we go again it has to perform very well and with uh, you know fine angular resolution so that you can drive things uh, at a given speed or to a certain position or that sort of thing so I um, uh, just want to mention that 
Um, the next topic uh, after that is one we'll look at here right now called um, driving uh, brush DC motors with an H bridge. So um, you will have learned about the brush DC motors from um, these YouTube, the first two YouTube URLs in this set of six right here. Um, so brushed DC motors, let's, um, let's do this. We'll make this big. Eh, maybe not that big. Okay. So um, the classic H-bridge circuit, sometimes called a full H-bridge, is, com is comprised of two half bridges or half H bridges or something like that. And I swear we've talked about this before, um, I, although it, I, I couldn't remember where. Um, but what we have is we have, um, you know, a power supply positive lead, a power supply negative lead. And it turns out that you can, um, with this arrangement here, they call it an H bridge because you have this uh, left half bridge and right half bridge and spanning across the middle you have the load. It could be a motor, it could be any number of things, but what's nice about the H bridge is that the uh, if, I, if I want to uh, spin it one direction, I can turn on switch one and turn on switch four and leave switch three and two off and current will flow, for, you know, conventional current will flow from the positive power supply down through S1, through the load, down through S4, and return to the power supply. If I instead turn S1 and S4 off and turn on S3 and S2, uh, conventional current will flow from the power supply through S3, through the load in this direction. Okay, now last time it, f it flowed through the load from left to right. Now it's flowing from right to left through S2 and back to the power supply. So if you turn those two switches on, um, you could cause a, a regular DC, you know, DC brush motor. If you hook it up backwards, it'll spin the wrong, you know, not the wrong way, it'll spin the other way. So here you have a reversing motor that can spin either direction, if you like. Um, now the following, um, you know, discussion, I, I, I grabbed and simplified the um, the, the diagram from a data sheet of the LMD 18200, which was originally made by National, which was bought by TI or Texas Instrument. Um, and I excerpted this from the from the data sheet, and you can see it may look a little funny here, but we've got a this would be the equivalent of switch S1, S2, S3, and S4. There, we're using MOSFETs here. And notice these are all N-channel MOSFETs. They're N-channel enhancement MOSFETs. Um, the arrow points toward P material or points away from N material, some people say. Well, in an enhancement N-channel MOSFET, the channel is formed across these terminals here. And so initially the channel is a P-type. Um, and then as you apply a voltage to the insulated gate, you draw elect a positive voltage, you draw electrons up. And so even though this starts out, the arrow is pointing this way toward P material, when you turn this thing on, it becomes an N channel. So these are N channel power MOSFETs. And um, the voltage between the gate and the source has to reach a certain level called the um, the threshold voltage, V gate to source or VGS. Um, and so we actually need, we'd actually, if we want this thing to, to act like VDD is flowing through it here, we need VDD plus a threshold voltage at this gate. And that's what this charge pump drive, you know, why, why are those words there, charge pump drive? It's because we're using a, an N-channel transistor on the high side um, uh, as, as a high side switch. And so we actually have to get a gate voltage that's up there a little higher than 
um, uh, the supply voltage to turn it on. And if we do that, if we turn on S1 and S4 here, remember, S1 and S4, okay, if we turn those on, now let's, let's look at our text here. So H drive controllers implement a classic four transistor arrangement where the load, typically a DC motor, but not always, plus a num uh, uh, arrangement where the load, plus a number of other useful features. Well, that's a great sentence, isn't it? But obviously it's a, um, uh, what we mean is that it, 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 um, it's an arrangement for controlling a DC motor um, but there are not only are there turn on and turn off but there's other useful features in it so in the diagram below the built-in logic senses oops sorry in the diagram below the built-in logic senses the direction input as high and the brake input as low direction input is high brake is low Two transistors are enabled to steer DC current through the motor in such a manner as to cause forward rotation. Okay, maybe, maybe this would be clockwise rotation or something, I don't know. But, uh, the transistors can be turned on and off rapidly to affect pulse width modulation control of motor current. So let's look at our diagram here. So if I turn this top transistor on, again, this charge pump will give me a high enough voltage that I can turn this transistor on and the motor will see VDD over on this terminal. And I can turn this transistor on. Uh, again, the, but there, all the transistors are N-channel MOSFETs. I can turn this tra transistor on, and this side of the motor will see ground. So with VDD on this side and ground on this side, uh, conventional current is going to flow from left to right through the motor and to ground. So that's with the direction input high, so there's some input logic in here, and the brake input low. And now the PWM input will be high some percentage of the time. And so what you do is all these transistors are off normally. And if you turn these two transistors on, say, 50% of the time, well, the motor would, on average, see about 50% of the supply voltage. and um, or you'd certainly have maybe 50% of the maximum possible current flowing through the motor. So it'll spin at some medium speed. If I had these on at 100% of the time, the motor would spin it the, the fastest it could. Um, and so on. If I, had, uh, if I had these transistors on at various, you know, percentages of the time, <coughs> pardon me, in a, in a pulse with modulation fashion, the motor would spin this initial direction, let's say it's forward or clockwise or something, at some speed controlled by the percentage of high time of the uh, PWM input. So it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that I can now um, set the direction low. Again, the brake input is low. We're not doing any braking. And the PWM input is high some percentage of the time. Well, with direction low, what happens is I turn on this transistor here. Again, this uh, charge pump drive would make the gate voltage of this N-channel MOSFET higher than VDD by the threshold voltage. So it would turn on, and this motor would see VDD on this side, and this transistor would turn on, and the motor would see ground on this side. Um, if these transistors were both on 100% of the time, the motor would spin either backward or uh, uh, counterclockwise or ho however you've organized the, the thing to do this. It's kind of you know specific to the application. But the motor will essentially sp spin the opposite direction as it did before. As uh, current through the motor now uh, travels, conventional current through the motor travels from right to left. Um, and you can turn on the transistors uh, some percentage of the time to control the speed of the motor. So you could have them on all the time. You could have them off all the time. You could have them on, um, I don't know, say 50% of the time, and the motor would spin at some intermediate rate. Uh, the last thing that you can do with this stuff, assuming your motor isn't too big, is that... 
regardless of what the brake input or PWM input are, you take this um, you take this brake input high, and it turns on a pair of uh, uh, of transistors, say in the bottom. So now, if this motor had been rotating either forward or or reverse, turning on these two transistors here essentially puts a short across the motor and any energy in the motor will be dissipated in this very low resistance represented by these two transistors here uh, connecting the motor now they're connected to ground but that doesn't have much to do it the fact that I'm that I'm trying to short put a short across the motor turns the motor into a generator and the load is a short so we're just going to heat up that um, you know these transistors a little bit um, and and convert the energy that's in the the uh, the inertial um, rotational energy that's uh, kinetic energy in the motor into electrical energy and dissipate it in these two transistors um, the diodes of course um, perform a function for us um, you know re uh, reducing transients when the motor is turned off because it's a big inductive load and um, there are also some parasitic diodes um, with the same arrangement in the uh, in the MOSFET so but understand that um, these diodes um, also help turn off you know turn off the motor um, properly so and protect the MOSFETs from seeing uh, incredibly high inductive voltage spikes on their collectors or sources or whatever terminals and that is how you control a brush DC motor with an H bridge um, again the H bridge you have the, the left half bridge right half bridge and the load spans the middle um, so that's why it's called an H. Uh, alrighty, and let's uh, let's drop that. And now in the Hall effect uh, animation, you know, I'll, I'll let you watch that. But essentially, any time that um, uh, electron current, or well, essentially also conventional current since it since it's just a backwards representation of electron current in conductors anytime you have a a, a current a conducting current path um, in in the presence of a magnetic field the magnetic field will deflect the charged carriers the electrons which are negative um, as they pass through the magnetic field and the electrons will pile up toward one side of the conductor, if you will, as they pass through. So if you measure the voltage across the, the, the uh, conductor, um, normally uh, voltage across the conductor would be zero because, you know, it, it, the resistance is so, so low that you wouldn't measure anything. But if you, um, if you make that... Uh, conductor out of semiconducting material sort of make, make it out of part of a transistor and you let the, um, the, the the current flow across it in the presence of a magnetic field the uh, the current will pile up on one side of this semiconductor uh, path and a voltage can be measured um, in a transverse fashion across the conducting path of the <coughs> semiconductor material and that's called the Hall effect. And um, uh, so, in in motion control, um, you might have a uh, let's say you had a magnet moving past a well, you could have a magnet moving past a coil, and you know a magnet whips past a coil, and that change in magnetic field. Um, impinging on the coil will generate a little pulse of electricity uh, in a Hall effect sensor you can do the same thing but you're going to create it by having the magnetic field distort the flow of current in that um, uh, conducting material and you'll measure that with a you know um, you'll measure that with a uh, maybe some little op amp amplifier or something like that or maybe the Hall effect sensor has enough sensitivity to 
um, you know, uh, be picked up by the microcontroller itself. Usually there's some kind of, you know, amplifier in there. But um, the Hall effect uh, uh, sensors are, are essentially magnetic field sensors. So um, imagine um, as your, um, imagine a motor that spins around. If, if it has a flywheel and there's a magnet in the flywheel, the um, Hall effect sensor um, can tell you when the magnet on the flywheel rotates past the sensor. Um, there'll be a voltage change in the sensor and you can pick that up. Uh, so, um, magnetic uh, position uh, sensors, um, you know, Hall effect is, 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 is an appropriate technology for those. And, you know, it can be used uh, depending on the sensitivity and the speed of response of the sensor. It could be used as um, what they call a throttle position sensor or um, for, for uh, cars controlling the, uh, you know, the, the, the introduction of fuel into the engine or into the fuel injection system. It can also be used to determine um, top dead center in the rotation of the uh, uh, crankcase, uh, cr crankshaft, and that sort of thing. So Hall effect uh, sensors are useful in motion control. So let's look at um, uh, the brushless DC motor. I want to look at a couple of data sheets here for these things and talk about a couple different brushless DC motors, and then we'll finish up with the um, with a stepper motor controller IC. So... Um, the DRV10866 is a Texas Instruments um, um, kind of controller. And um, as you might have seen, or I hope you saw, when you watched those six YouTube videos that I specified in the first document, um, one of the schemes for picking up the rotation of the uh, rotor in a brushless DC motor, because that's what we're talking about now, is brushless DC motors. Before we were talking about brushed DC motors. In a brushless DC motor, there'll be um, uh, um, this this uh, back um, magnetic electric force uh, you know the, the, this the scheme of picking up the uh, uh, I guess I, I would call it back EMF but um, picking up the uh, the uh, magnets um, picking up the change in in voltage from the motor as it is it's uh, commutated electronically okay you know a DC motor a DC brushed motor there's the commutator is split so that the motor reverses magnetism every half rotation and that keeps the thing um, going well that keeps it chasing the mag the magnetic field and and going around the uh, going around and around well in a brushless DC motor um, you tend to have um, three different um, you know, field coils, if you will, um, because this is a, a what they call a three-phase kind of operation, and that's that's similar to uh, three-phase electrical power, but it's you know it's not the exact same, and um, and so as the the, the rotation um, uh, as as the rotor uh, spins, you'll then have. Um, the the rotor magnet will 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 be drawn toward um, and pushed away from <clears throat> be pushed away from one uh, field coil and be drawn toward the next field coil. But as it whips by that field coil, there'll be this um, you know uh, kind of voltage uh, in you know uh, voltage transient. Um, in the drive voltage, and you can actually pick that up 
and use that as, you know, while you're driving it, you can use that as an indication of the rotation of the motor. Um, so, um, there's a lot of modes of running this synchronous rectification. PWM operation is one. And um, so, um, this is an integrated circuit. That's what we're looking at the data sheet of. We're looking at the data sheet of an integrated circuit <clears throat> to drive three phase sensorless. That's why we use this uh, uh, voltage transient to pick up the rotation. We don't have any sensors in it for uh, rotation. We don't have any Hall effect sensors in there. And we um, pick up a BLDC brushless, kind of weird way of doing, but brushless DC motor. So this is a driver chip. And you can see this chip only has 10 pins. And the typical brushless DC motor has three field coils all connected to a common. All right, so um, this wire right here is a common, and this chip has some transistors in it for driving this motor. And in this case, you can see the applications up here, notebook CPU fans, game station CPU fans, ASIC cooling fans. ASIC's just a type of chip. So basically, the small fans that um, cool down uh, chips, they might be bolted right onto the heat sink, those little tiny fans you see. Um, and, and this one, the whole thing runs, um, you know, it, it's, it's great for a 5-volt system, maybe even a 3.3-volt system. But, you know, the fan itself is probably needs 3.3 uh, to 5 volts. <clears throat> so what this thing does is, um, you know, there's a power supply voltage here, VCC. Um, and there's a PWM control signal here. And then the CS is for current sense. This chip not only uh, drives these magnets, uh, obviously not the common, but drives the um, U, um, V, and W field coils. Um, it drives them so that the uh, permanent magnet in the middle of the brushless DC motor will chase that magnetic field around. Um, but it'll also monitor the current that it's used, that it's putting into those field coils so that nothing uh, gets burned up and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so you'll see this in a lot of brushless DC motor controllers as a current sense capability. And um, one of the things that I stripped out in order to make the brushed DC motor uh, H-bridge um, more obvious, I, I, I kind of deleted out the current sense. But a, a lot of motor controller circuits have current sense so that um, either in the controller chip or in the microcontroller chip, you can kind of watch that. And, you know, you might be able to... Uh, uh, you know, signal a warning LED or something, or or, or 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 send an error signal of some kind. If you see too much current being drawn in the motor, that might mean that something is binding up in the machine or whatever. So, um, so here we have a pretty simple little, uh, well, simple. We have we have a small integrated circuit that drives the three um, field coils, uh, U, V. W and they're all connected in common so that goes back to this common lead there's a power lead here VCC and there's a uh, ground lead right here and there's look like there's an input for uh, for for PWM and the uh, I think they mentioned something about it here the PWM input can be from uh, 15 kilohertz to 50 kilohertz so so 15,000 um, PWM cycles per second to 50,000 PWM cycles per second. Um, and as we look at this thing, um, I want to remember that, uh, I guess this one, okay. I, I just want to make sure if I had any notes on pages for this one, but I don't think I do. 
you know, a data sheet, they typically identify all the pins and where they physically are. This diagram up here was more of an electrical kind of, you know, application drawing. Um, but, you know, for the person that has to design a printed circuit board and lay these things out, you need this, uh, you know, package uh, drawing. And um, now this is a 23-page data sheet. We're not going to go through all that. Um, so, uh, you know, the, these things are pretty much what we described. The PW input signal is converted to a fixed 156 kilohertz switching frequency on the MOSFET driver. The PWM input signal resolution is less than 1%, meaning you can control things, uh, you know, certainly at the at, at the one you know one hundredth or one percent granularity this pin can also control the device and put it into or out of standby mode after the signal at the PWM stays low for say uh, half a millisecond the device goes into low power standby um, so you can you know save energy by by using that, that that pin, but it also sets the frequency of all the uh, chopped up little signals that get sent to those coils. And you know, there's a lot of information down here. Um, you know, here's something where you know by the changing of the duty cycle, um, you can control the motors uh, the motor speed in revolutions per minute. And it's not quite linear, but it's, it's you know, close. Um, here's one where, you know, if you were just, if you wanted to get an idea of where you'd be um, speed-wise based on your input voltage, if let's say we're using 5 volts and we're, you know, PWM is like 100%, we'd be up here about, oh, I don't know, 3,400 RPM, you know, here. Here we go up five volts. This guy here is three thousand RPM. And th what's three thousand RPM? Well, there's sixty seconds in a minute revolution per, per minute. So three thousand divided by sixty is the same as three hundred divided by six, which is fifty. So um, at five volts, uh, we're somewhere between fifty and. Uh, uh, 60 revolutions per minute probably on the area of uh, 3400 I don't know maybe it's 60 or 56 revolutions per minute or something like that I'm not sure. so um, there's a lot of information in here as to how things are hooked up well th this is actually the functional block diagram inside the chip itself and it has um, you'll notice that it has um, a half bridge driver see the two tr the two MOSFETs right there uh, they use a P MOSFET for the high side driver and an N MOSFET for the low side driver so there's a uh, there's a half H bridge right there there's another half H bridge right there and there's another half H bridge right there so U V and W are each dr driven each each coil is driven by a half H bridge um, and the rest of this now each of those guys needs a little pre-driver here to make sure you s turn on or off the gates um, well and here's that current sense input they uh, that that's a symbol for a current source and I suspect that goes to like VCC or so I'm not sure where that goes but um, so you know current flows through the uh, through all the bridges and um, some part of that current flows through that external resistor and this current comparator looks at some reference voltage and looks at the voltage across that resistor and determines when you're pulling too much current and then uh, you know creates some kind of an alarm system and probably shuts the thing down um, and you also have a, a thermal sensor on the chip to look for those kind of situations 
Um, so speed control, the DRV 10866 can control motor speed through either the PWM in, in or VCC pin. Motor speed will increase with higher duty cycle or higher input voltage. So, you know, one of those, uh, typically the, the VCC is going to be fixed and you'll vary um, the duty cycle of the PWM input. Um, so, I think that's probably, what, there's that same diagram again. And there's all sorts of information here. They even have waveforms and all this stuff. Some, you know, have, they have to do a lot of work. Here's some suggested PC board layout uh, for that chip. This is a unusual, you know, I shouldn't say unusual chip, but the bottom side of the chip has, um, has eight solder balls on it. And I guess there's one more that's, um, there's some kind of a ground pad or something around it. I don't know, but that shows eight, and we know the chip has 10 pins, so go figure. Um, I, do, I, I don't know what, what the deal there is. Oh, no. I'm sorry. These are not pin, pins here. These are, um, what these represent is you put vias into your PC board. My, my bad, I'm just too tired. Um, you put vias into your PC board and when you solder this down, your leads are out here. Here's your five leads on each side. So there's your 10 leads. I must be completely gone. But these vias here, um, when you solder this down, you you melt the solder with um, with hot air and the solder is actually a paste. It's um, itty bitty bits of solder in a flux uh, matrix, okay? So to help it flow. And so these pins here, there'll be flux on all these pads where the, where the pins of the integrated circuit land. And then there'll be some flux into here and you can solder it and it helps it to conduct heat down through the board. Some people call these thermal vias, okay? and keep the thermal pad connection as large as possible both on the bottom and top side it should be one piece of copper without any gaps um, it's one piece of copper but it also has these thermal vias the copper pads that go through the board to the other side and there's a piece of uh, a copper on the other side so all this ground plane here and then through the through the uh, board itself you can you can provide quite a bit of heat sinking and that's the data sheet for the DRV10866. Now, um, let's look at a uh, at an application note from uh, the good people at uh, Texas Instruments, and see if we can. Um, um, actually, you know what? I'm I'm actually going to fix this right here in our video and make. So, so everything related to Texas Instruments is there. There we go. And um, this one here is produced by On Semi. I'm just going to make it, um, which used to be part of Motorola. Okay, so we have the manufacturer's name first. So let's look at this application circuit. Um, if we go to their website, Texas Instruments, like all manufacturers, have reference designs. Um, and, and here you can even buy this one for $25. You can buy a board. And uh, there's the... You see two five-pin chips. We can bit of a fuzzy picture, but there's one, two, three, four, five pins on this side. One, two, three, four, five pins on that side. That's a surface mount package, and um, there's some there's some jumpers here. Those, those things. There's a, a trim pot 
you know, a potentiometer right there. And then um, we'll, we'll see, you know, we'll see what this thing is. This is this thing is essentially a 555 timer IC, okay, uh, in order to produce uh, a PWM waveform. That PWM waveform goes to PWM in on this uh, DRV10866. And so by turning this, you can you control the um, the motor speed. And this is an evaluation circuit. By evaluation, you, mean you buy this thing, you hook it up, you measure some of these voltages, you look at things, you learn a lot from their reference design, and then you uh, include it into your design. And you may not use a, a potentiometer in your design, or, or, or you might. They actually have uh, integrated circuits that act like potentiometers. So instead of turning a knob, you, you know, a microcontroller talks to this thing and says, you know, make it this, make it this way or make it that way. But, you know, a microcontroller uh, would, would likely replace, you know, this, both of these uh, things, potentiometer and the 555, and it would just drive the uh, desired, um, uh, it would drive the desired PWM input and percentage, uh, pulse width modulation percentage into this chip, and that would give you your uh, speed. And um, so this is a five volt, three phase sensorless motor system, sensorless again, um, not senseless, sensorless motor system with variable speed control. And um, so um, they've got all sorts of uh, test data here you can download with um, obviously with scope waveforms and everything. And uh, we're going to look at the schematic. Um, now this one, so, so obviously this one, this reference design provides a simple way to spin and control a 5 volt three-phase BLDC fan motor with minimum development time and overhead. It utilizes the DRV10866, a sensorless BLDC motor driver, that, that, that 10, that, that 10866 is referring to. Um, for the power stage and a TLC, it's a CMOS 555. So TLC 555 timer to provide a variable duty cycle P PWM signal for speed control. The DRV10866 uses a 150 degree sensorless PEMF control scheme that takes away the need for external sensors on the motor. And you know, this the the it takes away the need for external sensors on the motor for motors within a certain application range. And you can imagine that, um, oh, uh, fan motors, uh, you can't, I don't know if you can imagine or not, but, but I, I'm just saying that certain applications, uh, the motors don't need the, um, uh, say, a position, a built-in position sensor feedback. Um, one can derive it from the voltage waveforms from the motor itself. And so that's what makes, um, oh, these, CPU fans uh, so easy to uh, build and sell is that they don't have to have sensors built into them to uh, effectively control their speed and do the job they need to do to cool down an important IC. All right, great. So there are reference designs in the world for all kinds of integrated circuits and that sort of thing. Um, let's look at the schematic in this case. Um, I'm not going to point out much that I didn't just say, but, you know, they, they've got some connectors o over here, and that's that's all well and good. Um, and they've got an LED here for status. I think, uh, you know, on means <laughs> there's VCC, so current flows through the LED through that resistor. And then when, when voltage isn't applied to the circuit, the LED's off, so... But here's the DRV10866 chip and um, the, the UVW is called MOT A, MOT B, and MOT C, and they come out to a connector. And MOT COM goes to pin 2, just like we saw. Um, and, and then uh, here's the PWM input. Up. Oh, there's your, your sense resistor for current sense. Um, and then here's the PWM input. Well, here's a TLC555, 
And by uh, adjusting this uh, potentiometer back and forth, you can set the duty cycle of the PWM that comes out of here. And uh, like most schematic programs, if I have a wire that ends and it's got a label on it, like PWM, and another wire over here with a label on it that says PWM, then effectively those wires are connected. Um, and that's just all the legalese and everything. So pretty simple motor controller circuit. Um, obviously this PWM input, instead of this being a uh, Instead of this being a, a, a 555, which is a handy way to control something, this could be a microprocessor um, with, with a special PWM output on it. And, you know, we've done that with the uh, basic stamp. But if uh, a temperature sensor on the CPU says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running a little warmer than normal, then you might up the, you, you might turn on the fan and then up the uh, the duty, uh, duty cycle of the PWM so that you know the, the fan blows a little faster, cools down the CPU, and then the CPU says, "Okay, I'm I'm doing pretty well." And you might even have a little, um, oh, say, pr proportional integral uh, control loop, a PI control loop there. Um, you could have a PID control loop, but I, I, I you know, the the uh, differential term in that case you might, might not be as critical um, you, you know there's not a need for that kind of precision so um, at any rate um, a microcontroller could supply the PWM input and control the speed of the fan motor let's look at the data sheet for this on semi MC33035 um, brushless motor. We don't need the word on semi in there twice, do we? Um, so let's look at this uh, on semi um, MC33035 brushless DC motor controller IC. Um, it's you know, controller IC, right? Integrated circuit. So let's look at the data sheet for that controller IC. And um, this one is a little different in that it doesn't it doesn't use the um, BMEF um, derived speed control. It actually talks to motors which use uh, um, Hall effect sensors. Okay, so um, you can see here this is a 24-pin integrated circuit that I guess uh, you can see that you can buy it in the dual inline package, or this looks like a, a SOIC package. Okay, um, and. So we, as we look at this thing, let's look at the, uh, oh, sorry, let's look at the uh, uh, kind, kind of the um, block diagram here. Now let's make that one bigger. Maybe I should do this. There we go. I think I knew what I was doing here. So, um, you know, this this looks like a an evaluation kind of schematic. You could build a, a board with this, and um, the integrated circuit is in this uh, kind of emboldened dotted line here. And here's a motor. The motor has three um, coils. Okay, it doesn't have a common lead from the motor. It just it just runs the coils in this fashion. And so this box over here, output buffers, these are external components. These are some MOSFETs probably that you would supply. And um, so here's your three, your, your permanent magnet rotor and your three phase field windings. And then these things that look like the TO92 transistors here, um, those are Hall effect sensors. 
that um, are all supplied, they all connect to the ground, and they're all supplied with um, this lead right here. Um, okay, so, and there's some timing here, RT and CT help to provide some timing, and there's a, um, there's a, a speed control here. So let's look a little bit at this thing. It's, it's, it may be very, uh, seem very confusing, but there's a kind of uh, rotor position decoder here that picks up the signals from the three uh, Hall effect sensors. And we have some commands in here as to what kind of uh, commutating we want and whether we want to go forward or reverse and whether we want to enable it or not. So, um, you know, the, the, the MC3335 looks at the position you're at in the motor and determines what it wants to do um, with the output buffers. Now, you see six lines going out here. Um, that's because this is, again, this has three uh, half-bridge drivers to drive these uh, to drive these coils, okay, and it, I'm not sure, it, it might actually be, you know, they, they would have drawn a ground in here, I think, so this, the way they're driving this one is they're driving one coil and through another coil and out, and then they're driving the next coil and through the other coil, and out, you know, it's kind of like that, and then the next thing they're doing is driving this coil and that coil and out, so um, like you're driving two coils at a time, and um, so, and they do them with various waveforms so they can get, you know, either 60 or 120 degree um, uh, decoding of position. And so we've got a current sense set up. I guess all the current drivers here. Uh, return their current to ground through a resistor and then there's a little bit of a low-pass filter here an, an amplifier a little bit of a built-in bias and that goes over into this thing and and helps this uh, control logic here uh, build up the PWM signal um, you know so, so as long as the current you know these guys probably uh, this guy brings back something that senses uh, how high you want the current to go, and then the PWM will, you know, apply that kind of pulse waveform. But when it reaches it, it, it shuts it off. So if this guy goes above this reference here, this guy would go positive, which would reset this flip flop and block the oscillator from setting this flip flop. So, um, okay. You know, uh, I'm not asking you to look at and understand every facet of this, but you, you can see that there's there are output buffers here, some external transistors driving a three winding motor, three uh, Hall effect sensors come back, and I'm telling you that there are three uh, half bridges in here that are doing that. Um, the chip itself picks up position from the uh, Hall effect sensors, and then that that helps to determine, you know, what the drive is to these pre-driving transistors, which then drive the uh, the output drivers. Um, let's see if there's anything else in the in this um, data sheet. You know, you've got all sorts of things here. Uh, um, you know, based on PWM and that sort of thing. And they'll describe the whole thing here. I mean, it's 30 pages, but... And uh, they give the entire truth table for the... Uh, for what's going on there. They even have a, a braking ability in these things so they can dump energy that's stored in the magnetics of the motor in order to bring the motor to a stop more quickly. And we saw that with brushed DC motors in the H-bridge. Pulse width modulator. Um, uh, 
yeah, they describe in detail how uh, how all these things work. Give you some formulas for figuring out some of the important design uh, things, and we're just a little over halfway through this data sheet. Um, here's the same diagram you saw before, but now they're giving you some uh, some some signals here that was you know that you're going to see. Uh, notice they draw the motor a little differently now. Now they draw the motor so that it's in the delta format, and there's no common uh, thing here. Interesting. And here they they have a different application where there's a motor with the uh, what some people call the Y winding, where the common lead is brought out to. Um, the motor, I guess that's the supply, or it's ground, or something like that. It's not ground. VM, what is VM? There are 23 and 23 places that have VM in them. And it looks like um, let's keep going here. Okay, so VM is the um, voltage used to drive the motor. In this case, they're dri they're driving a pretty serious motor because they got 170 volts on VM. So that's the supply for driving the motor. Yes, this is due to the lack of upper power switch transistors, as in the full wave circuit used to disconnect the windings from the supply voltage VM. There we go. So it is the supply voltage. And each of these guys, each of these transistors pulls current through each winding uh, based on the, uh, you know, based on the phasing. So this is the common supply to the motor, and then as each transistor fires, it pulls current through the uh, uh, through the winding, and um, yeah. So whoop! What happened here? Sorry, that's um, 
That's not where we want to be. This is where we want to be. I don't know what happened there. So now we have... Um, here's a good example of where you can see the three, um, three half bridges driving the, the motor. Um, see, there's a P-channel and N-channel MOSFET, and the joining point between them goes to one of the uh, field windings on the motor. And it just goes on and on, different uh, ways of wiring up and that sort of thing. But, you know, it, uh, well, this is a four-pole motor. Four-phase, four-step, full-wave motor controller. And it just goes on. And finally, we have the package outline, and that's it. But what's important here was that every winding required an H bridge, uh, half of the bridge, right? And we also saw that, um, you know, um, now in this case, it, 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 in, the, in the various circuits we saw here, let's go back up to our first application circuit. So um, as we saw in the lower ones, this guy has uh, six inputs driving three coils on the on the field winding. Each th that means there's uh, there's two transistors in each one, but that's a uh, that means each coil has a half bridge driving it. Okay, and um, and also this particular one used Hall effect sensor feedback, right? So this isn't a physical representation of the motor. This is just an electrical representation. All right, great. So that is um, brushless DC motors. Again, brushless DC motors kind of a misnomer. They're really, well, I don't know. You can use DC for them, but in essence, you're creating with uh, switching circuits three different phased DC pulses. They could just as well be AC pulses if you uh, change the reference voltage. So it's, it's, it's kind of an AC motor, if you will. It's a permanent magnet AC motor where uh, you create this, um, you know, three-phase rotating magnetic field. And, um, you know, there's a lot to it as far as... Uh, different ways to energize it and measure it and control it but uh, essentially once again it's a rotor chasing a rotating magnetic field and lastly we have the stepper motor uh, controller this is a very common one used in a lot of do-it-yourself circuits because it's such a good controller and this outfit Allegro is over in Worcester Mass used to be called Sprague Electric and um, uh, as you saw in the videos you watched, the last two on stepper motors, um, the stepper motors have an interesting arrangement of the pole pieces. And there are uh, two different coils in the stepper motor, two field coils. And so we have out one A and B, and we have out two A and B. So by pulsing these properly, now you, I, I believe you guys may be hooking up a stepper motor to an L293 uh, kind of dual H bridge uh, circuit. And um, that's great. And you'll have, you'll, the microcontroller will actually control whether the outputs, um, uh, you know, the, the, the phasing and sequencing of the outputs in order to make the, the stepper motor move one tick at a time. In an A4983 uh, or 4988, these are such popular circuits because um, they do all that business and the microcontroller just has a, um, a direction input, a step input, so you tell it which direction you want it to go and you, 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 if you want it to go, um, 
uh, 200 steps is one revolution because it's 1.8 degrees for most of these steppers. So if you want to go one revolution, you send over 200 step pulses, okay? And the speed is controlled by how frequently you send the, the step pulses. And you can obviously only go up to a certain speed. Um, the rest of the stuff, you've got ground, you've got some current sensing stuff where uh, the two coils, the current goes through a resistor to ground and inside are amplifiers to measure the voltage drop across that resistor and make sure you're not trying to you know, pull too much current through your stepper motors, which would bound, burn up your drivers. Um, there's some timing circuits in here, so you, you just hook those up. Um, there's an overall enable, an overall reset. Um, reference voltage isn't necessarily needed for, for us. Um, and there's a, a VDD as the power and ground. So we have step. That tells us... Um, you know, to go 1.8 degrees, direction tells you whether to go clockwise or counterclockwise. Enable says, you know, this whole thing is uh, on or not. And reset resets the internal state of this controller. But that's pretty nice. I mean, you could you could hook up a demonstration circuit with some kind of a debounced switch on the step input and a, and a, a toggle switch on the direction input and, and, and watch the thing move. So, um, now this, uh, what's nice about this with a microcontroller, this takes a lot of work out of the microcontroller. So the microcontroller can be less of a chip. And these chips are very affordable, so um, sometimes it makes sense to do that. Um, so let's go down here. Now we're, so that's page one. And what I say, especially when I look at pages one, three, and six. So if we look at page three, and the description tells you all sorts of things about this controller, but if you look at page uh, three here, you'll notice that, let me shrink this back a little bit, or we'll go back up to this size. And let's look at page three. Here you go. This, um, in order to drive the, the um, field coil um, one direction or the other we need a full H bridge um, per coil uh, on, a, on a stepper motor driver so you'll see there's an H bridge in here for this coil uh, output 2 A and B and there's a, a H bridge in here for this coil output 1 A and B and um, VBB is is the voltage supply for driving these stepper coils and you'll notice that the current through the bridge is returned to ground through a resistor and we'll see what the size of that resistor is it'll be pretty small but in each case in inside the chip there's a wire that goes from that sense thing into a comparator or amplifier of some kind this one comes down here like this and uh, the microprocessor can um, load up this, uh, this digital to analog converter um, to limit the current to a, to a desired amount. We'll talk in a minute about MS1, MS2, and MS3. Um, in the video, they talked about half-stepping, quarter-stepping, micro-stepping, well, MS is microstep, and with this, with these three um, three bits, you know, you can select up to eight different uh, options with three bits, because it's uh, two to the third, which is eight. And there's a little table in here, and uh, this goes up to actually being able to microstep. And in microstepping, what you're actually doing with these coils is you're kind of well, once again, you're pulse width modulating these coils in a way so that you don't just have the 1.8 degree steps by putting a, f a, a, a portion of your magnetism into one coil and a portion into the other. The, mm, the stepper motor rotor will move um, fractions of that 1.8 degrees um, you know between two successive positions so now 
if you know if your load isn't too heavy you might be able to go to a a 1 to 16 micro stepping or essentially 1 16th micro stepping and you would get 16 times 200 or 3200 positions per per rotation and that that's pretty um you know that that's uh, uh you know pretty small um instead of 1.8 divide that by 16 you're now down um, just over uh, 0.1 degrees per step and you might not want to go that far but you get to select it um, w whatever resolution you think you can handle I have a friend who actually started a small side business building <coughs> um, telescope positioning systems and his, his first generation product used stepper motors and um, stepper motors are neat because sometimes you can hear them sing as they're stepping uh, as, as they're turning you know the, the, the pulses uh, that step the thing actually if they're coming fast enough can kind of create musical notes because you've got some mechanical movement there um, and whenever you do that um, as things vibrate you're you, you know you can produce sound waves um, and you hear these things as the uh, as the rate of movement of the stepper motor is ramping up um, you'd hear this increasing pitch tone and then it would stay there and then as it's decelerating to stop where it's supposed to you'd hear this descending tone um, and it was kind of cool but it was a an effective way to build a uh, telescope positioning system um, he later went on and in order to control uh, bigger scopes with more precision the last I knew he went to uh, um, well the last I knew he went to brushed DC servo motors um, but he, he may have he may now be doing brushless um, DC servo motors. One thing about brushless DC servo motors, if I may, is uh, whether, you know, can you use a brushless DC motor in a servo application where you have this real precision um, position and speed control kind of regime? And for a while, um, the one area where servo motors had trouble was in this thing called cogging because you basically have three drive um, uh, f uh, phases, you know, three phase rotation. And at a very low speed, um, the DC servo motor uh, would have a certain amount of, um, you know, cogging, that, that is jumping to the, to the uh, center of each phase you know, 120 degree kind of thing. And these controllers are trying to mitigate that and make the, uh, the transition more smooth. Um, so that's a, that's a question I don't know the answer to right now. I do know that you can buy some pretty good brushless DC servo systems. So people are solving that problem. And when they solve that problem, it means that someone does not have to go into the machine periodically get down to the dc motors open them up and replace the brushes which are kind of a ceramic carbon sort of material but it does wear as those split commutators rotate around uh, on it so all righty uh, so in a stepper motor um, as you as you do it in lab you'll see um, that the uh, you'll drive individual coils with um, essentially a full H bridge because the L293D has uh, two full H bridges in it. So each coil of the stepper motor needs a full H bridge so, so it can be magnetized in one direction or the other direction. So that means each coil needs a, a full H bridge in order to be able to put current into it in a forward or reverse uh, uh, manner. And by pulse width modulating that, um, that drive to those things, you can, uh, you can achieve this uh, micro-stepping kind of deal. So really nice chip. Um, 
And uh, let's see, that was page three. Page six had something interesting in it. I forgot what it was. There's page, oh, page six has the truth table. So here's the truth table. You know, all three low is the classic uh, full step um, two phase excitation mode, right? And that's 1.8 degree per, per thing. If I put in a binary four, I get half step. If I put in a binary two, I get quarter step. If I put in a binary one, I get eighth step. And if I put in a binary seven, I get 16th step. And then these are the names for the uh, phasing modes that allow that to, to occur. Um, so just wanted you to know about that. Um, a stepper motor control chip. There are many of these around. But if you're looking at uh, oh the Spark Fun, uh, uh, what's the other one? Lady Ada there. Um, well, anyway, if you're looking at the the, the major do-it-yourself places and and the industry too, um, this A four forty nine Opolo Lu is another one that does a lot of motor control stuff for robots, and robotics, and things like that. This A4988 and A4983, which I believe is a slightly lower current version, are very good stepper uh, motors, so uh, uh, stepper motor drivers. And um, Adafruit, that's Lady Ada. Adafruit and SparkFun and Pololu. Um, so uh, they, they all have this chip on a little board that you can use. And... Um, in fact, why don't we take a look at what these what these uh, guys sell? So if I go to Spark Fun, um, here's a little H bridge deal, um, and and obviously you can get them more cheaply. But they uh, this TB sixty six twelve is got um, I think it has two H bridges on it and you can look it up in a data sheet it's the T there it is right there TB 6612 um, and I think it can drive uh, maybe <clears throat> up to 1.2 amps if you if you put the two H bridges in parallel you can use them as one bigger H bridge it can drive like a, a like an like an amp let's see the output current is limited, is rated up to 1.2 amp per channel or up to 3.2 amp for a short single pulse. And blah, 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 blah. So, um, let's see. The TB6612 FNG motor controller can control up to two DC motors at a constant current of 1.2 amps. Uh, two input signals can be used uh, to control the motor in one of four functions clockwise counterclockwise short break and stop the two motor outputs a and b can be separately controlled and the speed of each controlled via a pwm input signal with a frequency up to 100 kilohertz so um there's there's an example if you had two small um dc motors and you wanted to control them you could do it with this chip um, as long as you didn't need more than 1.2 amp in each chip. And you see how small that that um, that surface mount chip is. The reason it can dissipate um, the power to drive these motors is that the uh, the MOSFETs in the in the H bridges are so low resistance that they don't dissipate very much power at all. And you're when you use them, they're either totally on or totally off because you can use pulse width modulation to control the speed. And so it becomes a great uh, space reducer and it doesn't you know, get real hot and all that kind of thing. So that's, the, um, that's a, a, a regular H bridge. I'm thinking, um, I, I wouldn't doubt it if they uh, still sell the 293. So they'll sell you the individual chip. I'm surprised they didn't have it on a board. 
And here's a little tiny stepper motor for eight bucks that you can control with that with that chip. Now the the again the L two ninety three um, one amp controller is uh, this is two full H bridge a uh, quad half H bridge okay. Um, capable of driving high voltage motors using TTL 5 volt signals and it's also available from TI as an SN754410 uh, up to 36 volts at one amp right so you can you can talk to this with uh, you can talk to this with 0 to 5 volts on one side and, and the other side can be driving up to 36 volts and you know, let's see here you can get a dual motor gearbox for building a robot, right? And okay, so so a couple of H bridge chips. Let's see if they've got what they've got in terms of uh, well, they've got a heat sink for a forty nine eighty three. We'll see about a forty nine eighty eight. There we go. Um, so here's a stepper motor driver. You can see how small that chip is. Um, again, MOSFETs are your friends when it comes to switching current with um, uh, a low, you know, low footprint. And then, and there's there's a heat sink you can glue onto it if you want to. Um, and you can get this for much less money elsewhere. It's a pretty simple circuit. There's this, the Big Easy Driver divine, designed by Brian Schmals is a, okay. Well, I'm sure Brian pretty much grabbed the application circuit out of the um, uh, Allegro A4988 <clears throat> data sheet. Um, but that's, you now there's a board there and, uh, you know, you can control the things you've got. If you look at this thing here, you can see MS pins for MS1, MS2, MS3. Um, reset that sleep thing. Here's where you put your power in v, v, uh, VCC and then ground. Um, I don't know what ST, oh, step. The step input and the direction input are there. I guess all these are brought out also to pads over here, which is probably good. This is for a connector, a 0.1 inch space connector. And this is so you can hook up wires to it. That's that's neat, I like that. And um, your, your uh, stepper motor coil windings are over here somewhere, A and B. There's your two, uh, Stepper motor coil windings. There's a ground over there as well, and um, so uh, there's stepper motors. Now, do they have any controllers for uh, brushless D uh, brushless DC motors? So I'll just put BLDC in their product menu and see what we come up with. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, and brushless DC motors are making, you know, they're they're in they're they're certainly in the RC uh, world, um, and you can you can get some pretty expensive brushless DC motors there, you know, for high efficiency and so. Um, I don't know. Let, let's take a look at this board. And the chip that's on here is a Toshiba TC seventy eight B 9 FTG. I see three phase BLDC motor controller that does not require Hall effect sensors. So this is one that, um, you know, uh, is meant to drive motors without Hall effect sensors. Um, Okie doke. So, um, you know, handy components for motion control. Um, and, you know, uh, so, so all the things I'm showing you here are for small motors and, and, you know applications uh, that are pretty pretty um, well I don't know vi vi pretty easy to imagine but 
Um, obviously, these chips, especially expanded with external um, MOSFETs and some circuit design, um, can you know the same technologies can be used to drive some pretty large, powerful motors, and and that is done. So, um, all right, uh, let's see. I think we're going to call that um, a lecture. All right. Um, and I will have a homework or quiz type of thing uh, related to um, all this yakking and uh, hopefully uh, cover the most important parts of these uh, motor control technologies. All right. We'll see you next time. Take it easy. Bye.